Good evening and welcome to St. John Lutheran Church in Ely, Iowa to our Wednesday evening worship. I'm Pastor Brian Middleswarth. It is good to have you with us on this beautiful uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, a sunny and warm day. It looks like it's finally going to get to be summer for us here. I'm uh, thankful uh, for this opportunity for us to gather together here in the middle of the week. This will be my opportunity with you uh, around these texts. Uh, my wife Karen and I will be gone this weekend, and so uh, if you come to our weekend service, uh, you will be led by uh, Pastor Travis Borkowski, I uh, would invite you to tune in or attend so that you might see um, what's going on, uh, how he might attend to these things as well. It is Wednesday, and that means that we are in the middle of this busy work week. And so as we think about uh, moving forward, uh, let's take a moment to breathe and get ourselves centered into this time and place. Our breathing is in through the nose, out through the mouth, and it is an opportunity to kind of remove all of those distractions around us so that we might be fully present for each other and present uh, with God. And so, get ourselves kind of settled and we'll breathe three times. We breathe in and out. We breathe in and out. We breathe in and out. And we open with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, voices to proclaim you. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate in your glory and worship you in spirit and truth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'm actually going to share two of our readings for this coming Sunday, and I invite you to attend to them and also to consider the ways in which we might hear these texts together. The Revised Common Lectionary, which lays out the readings for each Sunday, have been placed together on any given Sunday because those who are looking at these texts believe that there's some kind of common thread or theme. So trying to discover or discern what that thread or theme might be can be an interesting way for you to begin to engage with those texts. Our first reading comes from the third chapter of Genesis. Adam and Eve heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her offspring and 
your offspring and hers, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Our gospel text comes from the gospel of Mark. Jesus went home. And the crowd came together again so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat. When his family, Jesus' family, heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul. And it's by the ruler of demons that he casts out demons. Jesus called them to him and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, that, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to Jesus, called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. So what does one do with these texts? They are familiar, certainly the story of Adam and Eve. It's one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. That's how close humanity was to God. But... They hid themselves from God. Why? They knew they were naked. They had understanding from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they did not have before. And as a consequence, they are sent out of the garden. What do we do with these texts? My colleagues and I had a far-wandering conversation this past Tuesday. One of the places we went was law and gospel. This text from Genesis is often pointed to in terms of the law. For Christians who happen to be Lutheran, we read scripture through these two lenses. Law are words that condemn, that convict. They often are words of have to, should, must, but they are words also that we hear as oppressive, as conviction. Law, words of gospel are words of promise, words that free. Now, one of the interesting things is that law or gospel is also in the ears of the hearer. For one who has been raised without boundaries, without limits, having them, a clearly defined space in which to operate can be freeing. For some, the passage 
throughout Scripture, the passages uh, that talk about God always being with you, that there is no place you can go that God is not, neither the highest mountain nor the depths of Sheol. For some, that is gospel. Good news for others, that is law. It is oppressive. It condemns. What do we do with this text? At least one commentator talks about this not as a falling down, but a falling up. That the humans in the garden are move, moving beyond a childlike state of naivete and facing the realities of life in a grown up world. As one author put it, by partaking from the tree, the primal couple gained a level of self consciousness, an awareness of their vulnerable condition. They realized they were naked. And their newly acquired ability to make decisions on their own, unwittingly in their choice to become fully divine. Because remember, this is what the serpent tempts them with, is if you eat of it, you will know the things God knows. In their choice to become fully divine, they become fully human. The implication being that being fully human is being willing to embrace your vulnerability. To see the fullness of things. That might be a way to approach this. I've always appreciated the humor in this scene. God asks, where are you? That's an interesting little passage to take a look at to see exactly what that question is. Where are you? And Adam answers, I heard you. In the garden, I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat that fruit? And then Adam says, she made me do it. And Eve says, the serpent made me do it. And the serpent says, no. Nobody left to blame. Isn't that interesting? From the beginning, the human impulse when we are caught in something we ought not to have done is to pass the blame. To try and pass off the consequence that is attendant to our own sin. sort of reminds me of uh, the famous line, uh, oh shoot, now the movie just went out of my head. You can't handle the truth. Anybody recall that movie? Yes, A Few Good Men. Thinking about our gospel text, is that what's going on with the scribes? They come down from Jerusalem, they go out to the hinterlands of Galilee. So word of Jesus has reached even the center of Judaism, even though he's out basically in the hicks. They've come. They acknowledge he is doing powerful deeds. In a way, it's like John, or Nicodemus in the Gospel of John last week, right? We know you, you are from God. Why, you can 
only do things of power if, if you have God with you. Here, it's not that God is with you. What they're saying is, yes, you have power, but because the way that power is being used does not conform to their understanding of how that should be, how God works, they attribute that power to Beelzebul, who is the god of their ancient enemies, the Philistines. And this leads to one of those passages that I often get asked about in classes about the unforgivable sin. I thought there was no such thing. Well, my general response is the reason that blaspheming against the Holy Spirit can never be forgiven is because forgiveness comes from approaching God, but if you don't think the Spirit that is attendant there is God, you're never going to approach it for forgiveness, right? It lies not in God's unwillingness to forgive, but on the other's unwillingness to approach because they misapprehend. They can't deal with the possibility that this is how God works. Just like his family can't, right? They come out to restrain him. He's gone out of his mind, is literally um, what it says. Um, he's, he's put out of place. He's gone out of his mind. He's filled with the ruler of demons. And then he does even more than that. He recasts what it means to be family, right? Who are my mother and my brothers? It is those who do the will of God. It's not my blood kin but it's those who do the will of God. So what are some things to ponder and take from these texts? One is what we know about scripture beyond these texts. There is punishment. There are consequences for the actions of Adam and Eve, certainly. But even in that, there is not rupture of, there is not a total divorce of relationship between God and humanity. And from that moment on, God is continually coming again and again to humanity to try and restore this relationship that has been broken. And the fullest expression of that is Jesus. Jesus does not dismiss or rupture relationship with the scribes. He just responds. He engages again with the crowd, trying again and again to clarify this is what it means to live in the reign of God. This is what it means to live so close to God that you can hear the sound of God walking in the cool of the evening breeze. Why is it so hard for us to accept these things? To see our own faults, to confess them, and to move on. As a 
A friend of mine used to say, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. We prefer to cover over, to ignore. Why is that? Do we not trust God's forgiveness? Do we not trust that our fellow believers will actually follow through with the forgiveness we are to offer one another? Even more than forgiveness, the reconciliation. This was another part of the conversation we had. Our language is so limited and the way in which we use it. What God seeks is reconciliation, which is a renewal of relationship. Forgiveness can be... Forgiveness is part of the equation that equals reconciliation. There is also a repentance, which is more than an I'm sorry. It is a true changing of the mind, of the self, of direction. You can have repentance, someone who has committed a wrong and harm, who is truly sorry, who has changed, but the one who has been wronged will not receive it. There is not forgiveness there. But in many ways, I think forgiveness is for the one who is wrong. It's not for the other. At least not until the two meet. And then reconciliation is for both. I can forgive someone who has done a wrong to me, and yet there can be no repentance. The benefit is mine. I have set, I've freed myself. There's gospel, right? I have freed myself from that which binds me to revenge, that binds me to hatred, that binds me to things that ultimately just destroy me. They don't do nothing for the other person. And in the same way, if they repent, but the forgiveness is not there, they are freed. They have turned. But what God seeks is the meshing of the two in reconciliation, a restoration of relationship. which is perhaps an exponential kind of thing. I think that's enough for us to ponder on. Let us take a moment or two to reflect on these things as we listen to this lovely music. I invite you to join me in the responsive reading 
I'm going to do the gestures just because I've done it so long, now I can't do it without it. So, the God of creation made the first day. The sun rises and the sun sets. Noah sat on the deck of the ark and watched a miracle. The sun rises and the sun sets. Joseph counted the days in his prison cell. The sun rises and the sun sets. David was inspired by the beauty of the sky. The sun rises and the sun sets. The man born blind saw the world's beauty and praised God. The sun rises and the sun sets. Mary prayed at sunset until morning when she could go to Jesus' tomb. The sun rises and the sun sets. We watch the days pass one by one. The sun rises and the sun sets. We enter into the night. The sun rises and the sun sets. God will keep us safe. The sun rises and the sun sets. God will give us rest. The sun rises and the sun sets. God will give us peace of mind. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, you are with us when we are at home and when we are away, when we lie down and when we rise. We are grateful for the gift of another day, for another chance to love you and love our neighbors. We are grateful for another day as your children, called, forgiven, beloved. Give us rest now, Lord. Keep us and all whom we love safe through the night so that we might arise renewed to sing your praise at the dawn of a new day. Amen. A couple of announcements, a reminder again uh, that uh, we will have a guest preacher, also uh, a guest organist with us this weekend. Uh, Anita Mickelson will be playing. Pastor Travis Borkowski will be present uh, this Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. You can join us remotely or in person if you wish. A reminder also uh, that uh, we are beginning our adventures with Flat Jesus. So Flat Jesus is going on uh, at the adventure with me and my spouse this weekend. So keep an eye out uh, uh, in our social media for uh, how uh, we may find Jesus in those places, invite you to take Jesus with you. It, uh, you can be a child of God of whatever age. If you don't have a flat Jesus from years past, there are links to uh, uh, downloadable uh, 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 PDFs that you can print of a variety of types of flat Jesus. Jesuses. I still haven't figured that one out. Um, what, the, what the plural is. Is it like sheep? Multiple Jesus or Jesus? But you can download those, color them, cut them out. We suggest if you're going to take them on the trip, maybe you laminate them. Uh, you can either do that somewhere else or get those sheets. Take them with you, take a picture, and show us where Jesus is on your adventures this summer. We ask your prayers upon uh, all of our students and teachers. Uh, some are ending this week. I know Iowa City isn't ending until next week. Uh, but please, uh, particularly for our teachers and administrators and staff of our schools, they have worked so hard for the last 12 plus months. Uh, and uh, I pray deep, deep rest and recovery for all of them, uh, for the work they have done, uh, and also uh, prayers and thanksgiving and rest for parents. They, too, have worked really hard over these last 12-plus months. I invite you to receive this blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.